Okay, I'll get started. Uh, uh, my name is Greg Zippel. Um, um, I'm a neurosurgeon at Washington University uh, in St. Louis, and uh, it's really excited to start this uh, uh, K-12 uh, uh, virtual seminar series, a series that's going to happen um, every other month, uh, one-hour sessions on this uh, evening. Um, we're going to have time to introduce the K-12 program, some of its leadership, uh, the goals of the uh, seminar series, and some of the topics that will be covered in the ensuing months later in on this session. But we do want to get to our two keynote speakers now uh, so we can make sure they have enough time that they can give their presentations. And we're also going to do a couple of breakouts uh, with some of the participants. So uh, maybe I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Gebhardt, uh, who can uh, begin the session. Yeah, welcome. So I'm Melanie. I'm uh, at Stanford. For those of you who don't know me, welcome everyone to this uh, introduction section. And we are quite honored to have Dr. Watson and Dr. Zahir from the NCI and NIH here to help to demystify the entire process. So afterwards, <laughs> everything will be perfectly clear. Um, and you'll have no questions, uh, I'm sure, in just a, a single 30 minutes. But both are, are exceptional, I think, really um, a lot of service to the community in terms of being able to help us to facilitate really great science that's um, that's centrally funded. So I, I do also want to just make one quick introduction um, of Sophie, who I think you guys have gotten a lot of um, emails from, and we will introduce her and more, more people who are, are helping to lead this program. Uh, at the end of the session, as was previously mentioned. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Watson, Dr. Zahir, in respect for your time, we'd, we'd like to allow you to, to please go ahead. Right. Well, thank you all very much. Um, uh, it, it's our pleasure, I'm speaking for both NAS and myself, um, to, to be here with you this evening. Um, as Dr. Gephardt said, we are going to try and uh, demystify some of the um, just to demystify the entire NIH in, in many ways and um, how to sort of uh, apply for a grant. We really want to give you a, an overview um, and some tips that are really going to help uh, your chances of, of getting funded, of you know playing the game, if you like, of the NIH and, and finding that right uh, grant opportunity and the study section for you. Um, I will sort of say there is obviously sort of the one big caveat is, is that there's no there's no magic code to getting funding. It's always going to start with um, you know great science. Uh, that's what we're 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 after. Um, but we're hoping that with the information that we're going to share with you um, that you will be able to better navigate sort of the path and at least know who you can sort of reach out to uh, and, and talk. The way we've structured this is, uh, I'm gonna give some big pictures, some overview, uh, more or less focus more on the, the research grant side of things. And then uh, Dr. Zahir will take over um, and she will talk a, in more specifics about fellowship and uh, fellowship grants and uh, career development grants. I always like to start with um, whenever I talk about developing competitive grant applications, to really think of it as if you are building a, a toolkit. There are at least three major components. The first is obviously impactful science. It, your science and the question, the significance of the problem. Why is it that uh, this work needs to be done? You need to have communication skills, good communication skills, salesmanship and grantsmanship. Writing a grant is not like writing a paper. Most papers are written with a retrospective sort of view, but writing a grant is very much a prospective view. What you're going to do, what that's going to mean, not what you have already done. It's a different skill set, but you've got to be able to convince somebody else, namely your reviewers, that your science is going to be worthy of funding. Furthermore, you can't go it alone. There is, you, you've always got to have collaborators. You've got to have the right expertise. You have to have the right facilities to do things. Um, as neurosurgeons, obviously involving uh, patient advocates is really going to be a benefit uh, to you. And we'll also tell you that NIH staff can help in terms of making your grant uh, competitive. Depending on your career stage, 
that's going to influence the type of grant application that you're going to submit. So you may be um, early in your career thinking about fellowships. You may be thinking about career development awards, or you may be ready for that research grant itself. These different types of uh, applications or grant mechanisms have different review locale. Fellowships and career development awards are reviewed by very specific panels, so you don't have a lot of choice in where they will go. But a research grant can be reviewed either in a charted panel or a standing panel or study section is another sort of name, right? And there's a lot of choice in those. They're put together so that there's often overlap between one and another. Uh, and there's, there is a whole bunch of people who can help sort of navigate which panel is going to be uh, best for your type of science. It's also important as you're planning your the submission of your application to consider sort of the dates. Fellowships, um, career development awards, research grant awards, they all have unique receipt dates. There are three of those a year. Fellowships, um, only have a single date. That's, so that's going to be both for the submission of new applications and it's going to be for the submission of uh, resub or resubmissions. Career development awards, research grants have both one date for new uh, submissions and then another date one month later for their for resub uh, resubmissions if need be. In any given year, there are, as I've already said, three different submission dates. These are associated with what we refer to as three different council rounds. Um, NIH peer review is two tier. So there is a study section review, and then there is what we refer to as an advisory council or second tier review. Both of these uh, are critical components. And what's important to keep in mind is that at any given time, you may have something that is being um, considered by the advisory council early spring. We've just had um, the NCAB or the uh, NCI advisory board met just, uh, just recently. We may have applications that are undergoing review. These are the ones that were submitted last fall. And we're also beginning to have the submission of new applications. So at any given time, you may have an application at a different part upon, uh, along these arrows. I mention this because it is really important to know that if you need to resubmit an application, you can't do so unless the summary statement has been released. So for example, we just had, um, if we're in the middle of a review round right now, but you say the, uh, a submission date is coming up, you can't resubmit that application without the, the summary statement being present. So if you're thinking about putting in a, a submission of, a, of an application, uh, how is it best to do this? The first thing we're always going to tell you is develop a timeline, plan it out in detail. And that's important because there are more than 20 different components that have to go into every different grant application. So listed here are, the, uh, are some of the components for a research grant. And so we may think of it in I need to put an abstract together, the specific aims and the research strategy, but all of these other components are going to get reviewed by the reviewers. And if your bibliography and your references don't agree with what how you're referring to applications in the research strategy, the reviewers are not going to be particularly happy. If you're missing letters of support or your bio sketch elements aren't, uh, aren't in agreement, reviewers are not going to be happy and you're going to reduce those chances of you getting a fundable score. So plan it out, plan everything out in detail. It's also important to discuss the project with mentors, with peers, collaborators, and with NCI, uh, NIH or NCI staff, um, could be NINDS staff as well. Uh, so we're gonna use the collective NIH program staff here. And I'll tell you um, a little bit more about that in a, a slide or two. It's important to identify the appropriate funding opportunity announcement. Some are going to be specific, some are going to be general. So depending on, on your research, on the purpose of your application, you need to make sure that you, you tag it with the right funding opportunity announcement. 
You need to find the appropriate study section or locus of review. It is important to know who's going to be on that review panel and get to know them, um, who they are, the types of science that they, they like, the types of things that those panels have, in fact, um, approved for funding uh, later on or selected. It's also important, really, particularly as you start out, to read submitted applications from colleagues. Read the ones that got funded. Read the ones that didn't make it. You can learn a tremendous amount from applications that were not successful in getting funding, right? You can learn what not to do. You can learn from good applications or applications that got funded, how they were presented, how the ideas were presented. Um, and you can draw uh, a lot of different uh, expertise. Once you write your application, have your colleagues critique it. You really want to get substantive feedback before you put it in. If you hand it to your colleagues and they say, well, you misspelled a word here and you misspelled a word here and I added a comma or two, that doesn't really help you. What you want are for people to really critique it. Your preliminary data, not perhaps as strong as they could be, or I don't understand how you got to this conclusion uh, and this hypothesis from these particular data. Have you considered these other angles? Those are the sorts of things that you want, and you want all of that before you actually submit your application. So how do you go about finding a program officer, somebody from the NIH who's really going to be able to help you uh, along this path as well? Well, first start by asking uh, mentors and peers who have submitted applications for names of people that they found were helpful uh, in their own path. That's always a good way to start. You can use the various institute websites. Um, this, for example, is the NCI Center for Cancer Training. And um, on that particular website, there's uh, a lot of all of the staff and the types of programs that they're associated with. Uh, the other link that popped on the slide is for the Division of Cancer Biology. That's my division. Um, and we have the same thing. We have a list of all of our staff and our various areas of of expertise, and you can reach out to, to any, one, uh, any one of those people. Another uh, online tool is the NIH report. Um, I'm gonna show this in a little bit more detail, but later on, but you can also find um, program uh, officer contact information uh, using that as well. So once you found your program officer, what sort of things um, can they help you with? They can help you identify those funding opportunities. We can help identify uh, study sections for you to consider. We can give you input into your specific aims. We can talk about your science with you so that we can um, help um, bring your ideas to fruition. We can tell you what we have seen in, in sort of study sections or the, or the types of science uh, that they, that the things that they are uh, really receptive to or things that they uh, that they don't. We can obviously answer lots of questions that you may have on NIH policy or budget questions, um, and we can alert you to any policy changes or special things that you need to consider. The most recent of which is the, the data management um, plans that have to be in all applications uh, now. Um, there are different types of funding opportunity announcements. So they come in different flavors. They have different requirements for um, associated with them. So a parent or an omnibus uh, announcement is really going to be sort of generally very broad. These are usually the investigator initiated or unsolicited research. Lots of institutes will participate um, in them and they are paid by each institute establishing its own pay lines. For the R01, which is sort of considered the gold standard of all research awards, the NCI is paying those at the 12th percentile this year for established investigators and for new investigators, and the 17th percentile for those early stage investigators. Program announcements with specific receipt, referral, or review criteria, commonly known as PARs, um, very similar to the program announcements, except they're going to identify a very uh, identify an area of increased priority and emphasis for a particular institute. These will be active for for multiple years, um, and again, they're going to be paid 
primarily by institute pay lines. Both of these, the, the program announcement and the program announcement with uh, specific receipt referral or review criteria are distinct from the requests for applications or the RFAs. A lot of investigators will interchange uh, funding opportunity announcement and RFA. Um, all RFAs are funding opportunity announcements, but not all funding opportunity announcements are RFAs. So there is, a, there is some distinction between them. An RFA is gonna have a very defined scope. It's gonna have limited receipt dates, maybe only one or two. Um, but what's really distinct about this uh, particular funding opportunity announcement is that they will have set aside funds. There's a lot of work that goes uh, into putting together an RFA upfront, including a commitment from the Institute to say that there is a certain pot of money specifically for these awards. They're funded a little, uh, a little differently, um, not necessarily uh, critical for, for that uh, this evening. So we found a, how do you go about finding these funding opportunity announcements? Every week, the NIH puts out a guide where it lists all the new uh, grants and contracts uh, opportunities. There's the guide also talks about notices, changes in policy. It's a sort of a, an email that can uh, be sent out to everybody. If you don't already subscribe to it, we encourage that everybody should in part because it will give you um, all of this information right in your inbox on a regular basis. The advantage of that, you don't have to go searching. And if something catches your eye, you know immediately uh, when it's, um, you, you have immediate access basically to that opportunity. You can also check various institute websites, um, either the NCI, uh, NINDS, we all list, um, funding opportunities that are more geared towards uh, our applicants and our grantees. And as I've already mentioned, you can contact NIH program staff. It really is important once you've identified that funding opportunity to actually read it. Um, I can't tell you how many people will actually submit an application where they really have not read that funding opportunity, they've missed some very critical components that need to be in your application. So you need to look at the overview information. This is going to give you critical dates. It's gonna tell you uh, how much the awards can be, those sorts of things. And then there is a much more detailed, there are more detailed sections where they'll discuss uh, the description of the funding opportunity, the thought process that went in um, into uh, why we need this, uh, this particular gap filled, those sorts of things. It will give you an idea of the angles to actually take in putting your research together. The application and the submission section, obviously those are critical. They're gonna tell you all of the various components that you need to put in an application. There's been an, a number of people who will put in um, supplement applications to support um, a, a, a young candidate and it will say, you know, include a, a career development plan. That's outlined in the application and submission section. And yet we've seen several uh, applications come in where there is absolutely no career development plan. So people clearly didn't read that funding opportunity announcement. And finally, I always encourage people to read the application review information because this is going to give you tips on how the reviewers are going to be oriented to reviewing that application. So on many occasions, when you realize how the reviewers are going to be oriented, you can make sure that all of the components are appropriate in, in your application as well. So if you found your opportunity, you know what you're going to apply for, helping now, uh, it's important to know where you're going to send it, what kind of study section. Most of the research uh, applications are gonna be reviewed by the Center for Scientific Review. Uh, this is their website here. They have a variety of tools that will help sort of define um, the various uh, study sections so that you can match your science with, uh, with the appropriate panel. Um, in the middle of the slide, 
Uh, it says find a study section. You can either put keywords or titles, or you can use the assisted referral tool. And this particular tool allows you to, in fact, put your entire abstract um, or and or your specific aims. Uh, once you hit submit, it will match your um, your science with previous science that has been reviewed in the various study sections, and then it will populate with a list of study sections that you may want to consider. Another online tool is the NIH Reporter or the and the Matchmaker uh, unit. The advantage, I think, of Matchmaker is it will give you access to um, all of the all of application similar applications. Here I searched for cancer metastasis, imaging, and neurology, right? And I can find program officials, I can find study sections, as well as all of the various um, grants that have been already awarded that are on this topic. When it comes to actually writing your application, I think it's really important uh, not to underestimate the power of grantsmanship because there is no amount of grantsmanship that's gonna turn a bad idea into a good one. But there's lots of ways that you can actually disguise a good idea. So it's not something to be taken lightly. It's not something that you can just throw together uh, in a weekend. I think it's also important to really emphasize that regardless of the type of application that you're putting together, be it a research grant or a career development grant, right? you must be an effective salesperson. You have to be able to convince people that your ideas are worth something. Because if an idea is worth nothing, if it had an idea is worth nothing, if it has no champion, and that champion is going to be your reviewers who will advocate on your behalf for your application. So you really need to convince those particular people. As I said, your reviewers are going to be your audience. And so it's important to learn to write for both the experts, the people who are going to be reviewing your application, and the non-experts on the that are going to make up the panel. Your assigned reviewers will set the tone for the discussion. They're going to critique the entire application. The other members will read the abstract and the specific aims if they're interested. Right? And so we always encourage people, you want to get as many people excited about your project as you can. The more people who are going to participate in uh, the discussion of an application, particularly from the standpoint of this is a really important topic, this, this from glancing through this application, they've really hit all of the high points. The more people that you have that way, the higher the scores are going to be or the better the scores are going to be. To do that, you really want to make your project easy to understand why it's important, why we need to fill this gap in, in science. It's potential, we're going to, it's important to make sure that you stress the potential to impact the field, what the goals are and how they're going to be accomplished through the approach that you're taking, right? So it needs to be readable. You always want to write for the person or the reviewer who has just had the worst day. The, uh, the, the refrigerator broke, they got stuck in traffic, all of these sorts of things. They now have to come home and read your grant. And so you want to write for that person. If they have to struggle reading through your grant, it's not going to do well. If, on the other hand, by reading through it, the flow of it, the organization, the fact that there are breaks in uh, in the text that allow the reviewers to breathe, there's a good chance that it will score better. So your application is going to be judged for impact. Impact is based on mainly two criteria, the importance, should the work be done, and the likelihood, can it be done? So how important is the question? How much innovation is there? How is it likely to move the field forward, right? Should this work be done, right? If the answer to that is yes, application's gonna score better. If you're the right person to do it, if you've got the right experimental approach, if you've got the right expertise and the available resources, can it be done? Yes, it needs to be done, yes. 
that's going to increase the chances um, of your application scoring well. I will say it's important to know who's going to be on that study section, particularly because if there are different perspectives in your field, you want to make sure that they're both covered in, in your application. Say why you think one, uh, one angle over another, but you want to make sure that you are emphasizing to the panel that you know that there are these differences. If there are key figures in your field that are represented on that panel, make sure that you cite some of their uh, their publications as well, so that they feel that you know your field, they know you know what you're talking about in uh, all of that um, in your application. Um, finally, there's lots of resources that are actually available to help improve your grantsmanship to talk you through writing uh, your application. I already mentioned that as program staff, we are more than happy to talk about your science. We're more than happy to look at your uh, specific aims for you uh, as well. Um, and finally, I included some, um, some resources and some links uh, that I always find are, are very helpful to share with applicants. Um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Zahir. Thanks so much, Joanna. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I am NASA here. Um, Sophie, if you could just tell me, um, I don't know how much time we have. I have, you know, I'm happy to skip slides. I can provide slides um, later on. So just let me know. I think just if there's either some time for question and answer or discussion or the small groups, um, if Dr. Hayden Gebhardt and Dr. Zipfel, if you agree. Do I you want to stop now and take some questions uh, before I start? Is now a good, like, natural breaking point or? Personally, I would say go ahead and um, okay. let's see what time we have left. And uh, I think uh, in terms of the announcements and discussion of the K-12 webinar series that we can keep that a little bit on the shorter side and We'll just see if we have any time for small group uh, discussion. Uh, we, we may not, and that'd be okay. Is that okay, Melanie? What do you think? Okay. And uh, you can just cut me off. That's, I shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. So uh, <laughs> I'll right. try to get through these fairly quickly. Um, so I work in the Center for Cancer Training at the NCI and the uh, Cancer Training Branch, and I'm the branch director there. Um, so we're responsible for overseeing um, all of the most of all of the fellowships and career development awards, um, training grants, K-12 awards um, at the NCI. So um, our mission at NCI is to support the workforce um, across all career stages, um, including uh, graduate medical students and postdoctoral researchers and clinical fellows um, and early career investigators, which is what I'll focus on here. So, Primarily, I'll be focusing on um, three different mechanisms, the KO8 Mentored uh, Clinical Scientist Career Development Award, the Loan Repayment Program, which might be of interest to many of you, um, and the F30, uh, which is a fellowship program for those in dual doctoral degrees. Um, so this slide really shows all of the different activity codes, or these three kind of letter and, and number codes um, that are supported by um, the Center for Cancer Training at the NCI. Um, all of them are, require uh, U.S. citizenship um, or permanent residency to apply, with the exception of two, um, the F99K00 um, Transition Award from pre-doc to post-doc and the K99R00. Um, those you can have a U.S. visa when you apply. Um, and then there's also diversity uh, focused uh, funding opportunity announcements. Um, so if you're an individual who identifies as uh, being from an underrepresented group in biomedical research, um, you may be eligible to apply for, um, you can apply for either one, actually the parent or the diversity focused funding opportunity announcement. So KO8 is an example of a um, activity code that offers both. Our success rates for uh, cancer training awards um, uh, vary between about 15 to 30 percent. If we look at the F30s um, and the KO8s, the success rates are 22 percent. Um, and the, um, the loan repayment program is fantastic. Here, a success rate of 67 percent. So if you are um, eligible to apply for loan repayment program, I really highly encourage that. 
It's a program that helps pay back education loans. Um, so eligible candidates are researchers conducting cancer-focused studies in clinical translation, pediatric cancer, cancer health disparities, epidemiology, population science, and prevention. What it is, is it, it, it supplies $50,000 per year. Um, it's renewable as long as you um, continue to meet eligibility criteria, which includes eligible educational debt. Um, what NIH requires in return is a two-year research commitment. Um, there is a deadline, uh, application deadline every November, and last year we funded 200, um, 211 applications. And the LRP, or the Loan Repayment Program, actually just recently released this really cool dashboard, um, which I encourage you to go look at, and it has a lot of really neat visualizations and data about the Loan Repayment Program, um, including, like, you know, the different states and how many uh, Loan Repayment Program applications they funded, uh, et cetera. If you're, you know, still kind of curious about which funding uh, mechanism you want to apply for, if it's a mentored um, award in particular, we have a new, uh, fairly new chat bot on our cancer training um, funding page, which will ask you a series of questions such as your citizenship status, where you're doing research, what career stage you're at, and then it will offer you a series of um, potential funding opportunities that might be of interest to you. Um, so I did mention the fellowships. These are National Research Service Award fellowships um, that the NIH offers, the F30 um, and F31s for pre-docs and the F32s for postdocs. So just to note here, I won't go through everyone in detail, but um, the pre-doc F30 is for those enrolled in a dual degree clinical program um, where you have no more than 48 months prior to um, your uh, initial application. And um, the there's a diversity-focused F31 funding opportunity announcement, and the diversity-focused funding opportunity announcement actually supports both dual degree and PhD only pre doc. So that's an important thing to know um, for those who identify as being from underrepresented groups. So for fellowships, NCI requires that the sponsor have research funding, so an R01 or an equivalent, um, because fellowships don't really fund the research project. Um, for NCI, you must have a clear cancer focus in your research. Um, and then these are the typical timings of submission of the applications, like year four in your dual degree program for an F30. Um, nearly 100% of, of the awardees have publications. Um, half of the awardees have first author publications, um, and about 25% have a publication with their sponsor named on the application. For KO8, um, these are the Mentor Career Development Awards for Clinical Scientists, um, and it really supports your experience, your research experience leading to research independence. So you must show that you are still in a mentored stage. Um, you can be a postdoctoral fellow, you can be a non-tenured junior faculty, so um, an assistant professor who has not yet um, obtained your um, tenure. And you must have a clinical degree with an active licensure. Uh, and like I mentioned, US citizenship um, or permanent resident status is required. Um, all areas of cancer research are invited um, to, KO, to submit a KOA application. And um, your uh, salary can be requested up to the legislative salary cap, plus fringe benefits up to $50,000 a, a year um, for research support and a total budget period of five years. And you're required to commit 70 75% of your um, professional level of effort, which gives you protected time. For surgeons, there's an exception where you can request 50% um, or more of your level of effort commitment. So how can you maximize your chance of receiving funding for a K? Um, so a K is structured a little bit differently than the R's that Joanna was um, describing in that you have the sections for candidate information and goals for career development. 
You still have the specific aims play page, um, but in com combination, these three sections um, with the research strategy, you have 12 total pages. They don't have to be divided up evenly. It really should be divided up in um, that the way that makes the most impact in terms of what you have to offer. So the specific aims is the most important page. It should be written for a scientist. Use short declarative sentences. Don't use jargon or acronyms. Clearly state, state your hypothesis and ensure that your aims test the hypothesis. Don't have in, uh, dependent aims. Make sure they are interdependent. And it should not be technology driven. Um, we have specific funding opportunity announcements for that. Uh, you could, you know, sprinkle in a little preliminary data and include the rationale for your research design. There's a series of questions that you can ask yourself as well. For the candidate information and the goals for career development, you really want to tell the story of your training path. What are the goals? Focus on the why and not what you did. Uh, include information that's not in your bio sketch. And um, really prepare a training program where you select mentors and an advisory committee. Um, Self-identify deficiencies in your training and address that with workshops and courses that you plan to um, take. And then use the grant to augment your training and indicate how it will maximize your chances of becoming an independent investigator. So the significance and innovation sections of the research strategy really should not be a literature review. It should lead the reader to what your hypothesis is um, and really demonstrate the critical question being asked um, and focus everything again on the hypothesis. For the approach, um, this really, like Joanna was describing, should demonstrate the ability to perform your work, um, show your contribution to the work and the feasibility of the experiments that you're proposing. Um, this can be structured relative to each specific aim that you're proposing. You really must show that what you're proposing is doable in the requested period of funding. Um, you know, if the studies are, are an extension of a current project, can you take the work with you? Um, and that sort of thing. So I won't go into all of these um, points here, but really some common fatal flaws are that uh, the you're lacking the big picture. You're lacking relative significance. It's not considered to be innovative or hypothesis driven or really just a poorly written, you know, poor grantsmanship can be a common fatal flaw. Um, again, like I said, dependence on one aim on another lacking preliminary data or sufficient detail um, and statistical analyses, um, also lacking anticipated results and alternative strategies, that's a fatal flaw. And then common issues that limit enthusiasm from reviewers is that if you have a training plan that's too generic. So if you can put someone else's name in the training plan, um, you know, and it just doesn't seem to be specific to you, um, then it's, it's too generic. The more detail, the better. Uh, also, all of your reference letters should be gl glowing and show that you're, you know, you're, you have a promising career ahead of you as an independent research scientist or physician scientist, for that matter. Um, so, just looking at scientific review in terms of looking at the K versus an R01, for example, I mentioned that the Ks have a few different scored review criteria: candidate, career development plan research plan, mentors, environment, and institutional commitment to the candidate, whereas the R01 has the significance investigator innovation approach and environment. Um, like Joanna mentioned, pay attention to the review criteria that's listed in the funding opportunity announcements because this will um, be distinct uh, across, different, um, across different funding opportunity announcements. Um, and then the part that uh, Joanna mentioned about finding the study sections, you actually don't need to do that for the Ks. Um, the Ks are reviewed, um, at least for NCI, they're reviewed uh, in NCI special emphasis panels. So we have a single study section um, for all of our KO8s, for example, are reviewed by NCI J study section. So know which study section is going to review the applications. Um, appreciate that the reviewers are, you know, busy. Like Joanna mentioned, 
perhaps they've had a really bad day when they get to your application, uh, be considerate of their time. So really lay out your grant uh, application nicely for them. Um, you can find the reviewers uh, on, so for specifically for NCI's KOA uh, study section, um, you can find them on this NCI webpage, DEA info, uh, and you can find the latest roster to see who was on that panel. If you're curious about what kind of um, applications NCI has been funding, uh, what kind of research, who they are, where they're at, um, you can use the reporter that Anna, uh, Joanna mentioned. Like, for example, if you just type in KO8 and CA, which is the NCI activity, uh, the NCI um, code, um, then you basically get a hit list of here. This is like 264 KO8s that come up. And when you click on one, you can find um, information about the, the principal investigator and the abstract for their application, which is public information. Um, and similarly, you can do a, a search in the NC, within the NCI portfolio to see what's being done. In the NCI, you can kind of sort by different um, disease uh, areas. So you could search specifically for, you know, brain cancer or brain metastasis, if you wish. Um, so that's all I have for today. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions and discussing with Joanna. I know I went very quickly. Well, that was great. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Nath, for uh, those uh, uh, great talks and, and all the advice you gave. I think by time, I don't think we're going to do uh, small group sessions, uh, but maybe we have about uh, eight minutes for some uh, questions. If anybody has any from the group, there's, uh, please don't be bashful. Uh, just chime in or raise your hand, please. Uh, Kristen Huntoon. Hi, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your evening to talk to us. That was really helpful. No matter how many times I hear these things, it's really helpful to hear everyone's uh, comments about how to direct your abstract and your aims, especially the ensuring that they're not uh, overlapping. Um, I was at a dinner recently and I heard individuals that were talking about their brain tumor research and how they were trying to get it either to NINDS or NCI. And it was a little bit above my, my level. I was trying to understand how you determine if your grant's better for NCI or NINDS, if it's an actual brain tumor or if it's basically the mechanisms of how you're conducting your study. NINDS has very specific, um, they have a very specific focus. My advice to anybody who um, is unclear whether or not it should be an NINDS directed application or an NCI directed application would be to talk to program people from both from both parts. I don't want to say only these sorts of things go to NINDS because off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly those sort of criteria. Um, certainly um, some of the program staff, Jane Fontaine, uh, I know is very, very helpful towards sort of applicants. And so having uh, an abstract and, and specific aims, reaching out to um, a program person from both institutes and say, is this more NINDS or is this more NCI um, will certainly help. I think the other thing sort of to consider is depending upon um, where you are in your career, NINDS may have different pay lines from NCI. Uh, one of the things that can happen is you can submit a grant and it could be assigned to NCI as a primary and have NINDS as a secondary, you know, then it makes it um, a little bit more easy to, to switch to one of the other institutes that need be. Thank you. And can I ask one other follow-up question to, to something semi-related? So if you, um, I'm helping out in the GTN um, network 
grant, yes. which is through NCI, I believe, yes. right? So if I want, so, you know, the whole initiative is to get things to clinical trial earlier, Yes. But as I've been doing the basic science year one and two stuff, I'm seeing that there's stuff that I personally may want to look at more so. Can I want to make sure that it's not viewed, that it's still part of the GTN. So if I was going to take some of the stuff that I'm doing and look more mechanistically, are you allowed to do that? If it's because I don't want it to be looked as though I'm using GTN money for ongoing studies. Uh, so if I understand you correctly, as part of that particular network, you've made a series of observations that you would like to pursue, which are beyond the scope of your actual funded application. Correct. Um, it, officially, no, you're not supposed to use money for um, for other sorts of elements many people do um so i think it would depend on the sort of the the scope of the experiments that you would want the other possibility would be to see whether or not there is any additional supplement money that would be available um for you to pursue that particular line of line of questioning Okay, thank you. I just know that we're getting close to the clinical part and there's less for the research. So this was yeah, there's always new applications. That's yeah. true. <laughs> that stuff. So. Thank you for the questions. Are there other questions for the uh, any of the participants? There is, I think Ahmed Ozer has his hand raised. Oh yeah, yeah, Ahmed. Yes, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, you talked about the training pathway and the weaknesses in it and what you, have you done so far? Could you touch base on what courses are considered, for example, like clinicians who may not have the strongest basic science grounding, what courses are considered relevant uh, in that they have alleviated the weaknesses? Could you touch base on that? Thank you. So are you asking what courses, are you asking me to suggest courses for to take as far as basic science? So you, uh, uh, in the slides that you showed in the training pathway, you said that, uh, you know, what weaknesses there are and what has been done to rectify right. it. And that was, yes. So what what kind of courses are we looking at? MPH degrees or, you know, master's degrees or something? Oh, okay. So, well, I mean, it's it really should be tailored to your research plan and your training plan. So it's hard to say, you know, kind of a blanket, these are the types of courses that you should be considering. Um, because it really just depends on what type of research you're proposing, what kind of expertise, you know, let's say you're, you're proposing a project where you're going to do a lot of sequencing, and you need to learn how to do data analyses, and you need to have some statistical courses, you know, that sort of thing. Um, maybe you might want to have courses in in programming in R. Um, I, you know, I don't know. It just really depends, and it should be very specific to um, and tailored to your training plan. That's why I was saying, you know, you shouldn't be able to just insert anyone's name into your um, your uh, career development plan because it should be tailored specifically to you. I hope that helps. I know it's pretty um, it's pretty general in that regard, but. You you. Definitely, Ahmed, the only thing I would add, Ahmed, is you definitely want to you want it to hit the gap, whatever your gap is. Yes. Um, you may you may have background, you may have expertise, you may have done certain things. The career development plan is is designed, and the courses that you would propose need to be designed to hit the gap that you know you propose is critical and important for your maturation as an independent investigator. If there are things that are overlapping, you already have an MPHS and you're proposing a biostatistical course that's gonna be viewed less favorably. So it really needs to hit your gap uh, uh, in terms of your expertise. So you're building on something and you're growing so you can become an investigator. That'd be my uh, addition Absolutely. to that. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Shelby. Hey there, thanks for including me. Um, thanks Nas for that uh, talk. It helps me a lot uh, understanding all the different mechanisms. I know you mentioned for a fellowship award, it's important that the the mentor have an R01 basically. Is that kind of true for a K08 as well? Um, 
Yes, uh, for the most part. I mean, you you do get a little bit more um, support in a KOA for your research uh, compared to a fellowship. Um, but yes, generally speaking, the reviewers will be looking for that um, or some sort of equivalent um, to that of that nature. Now, if if your you know mentor does not, you might consider uh, including co mentors. Um, you know, someone more established who who does have that uh, kind of R01 level funding. Yeah, uh, Dr. Han Johnny, who I think sits on the K award, uh, may have comments about this. But uh, or, or Steph, you just want to answer that? Anything more specific uh, about your observation? Yeah, I, I would say that is generally um, pretty much a requirement in, in some format. As, as Nas mentioned. If you know if the person has a track record but doesn't currently have one, and you have a co-mentor who currently has an R, you might be able to compensate for it. But it is something that's considered important because your primary mentor, the, their role is to help model for you how to get to that stage in career. So the notion being, I think, amongst the review group, that if the mentor is not actively R funded they're not gonna be able to provide that same level of kind of career mentorship instead in, in addition to the scientific mentorship. You know, it's not, it's not about them having funds for, for making any of your research happen, of course, because the K award is supposed to be you developing your independent research and, and you're getting funds to the K for the research itself, but it's just um, considered a very strong indicator of the suitability of that mentor and getting your career going, uh, moving forward. One thing I'll add is, because you're a neurosurgeon does not mean your primary mentor needs to be a neurosurgeon. And, and we've seen that over and over and over where you have co-mentors, but the primary mentor is the neurosurgeon. But it turns out it's the co-mentor who has the expertise and the, uh, you know, that you're really driving. So uh, I would just dispel that notion. You, you really need to have the topic expert who's R01 or equivalent funded. That should be your primary mentor. And if you're going to include a neurosurgeon, unless they're the topic expert, it's great to have an academic neurosurgeon who's going to be part of your mentorship team, but I would advocate that they're usually the co-mentor. It's the it's the topic expert is the one who should be the primary mentor. You you agree with that, Steppi, or others, Nas? Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Are there other questions from the participants? Am I missing something, Sophie? Am I missing a hand? <laughs> Okay. Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll thank uh, Nas and, and um, Joanna for their time. Uh, thank you very much. That was very, very helpful. And um, uh, if there's, uh, uh, we'll, we'll have other, some of those links and things, maybe Sophie and, and Kayla, we can get those out to people in some way, some of the links that were included in their talk uh, for assistance. I'm happy to share slides. I can send them to Sophie and um, so you can distribute them. Absolutely. And, and we'll Great. also share the recording. Um, we'll post it. Um, so it's oh, yeah, yeah. The notes. recording too. That's right. yeah, uh, okay. I would also add, uh, in addition to sharing slides, if anybody has any question that they think of in the next couple of days, um, you know, feel free to to reach out to, to NAS or myself um, or funnel questions this way. We're more than happy to help. I do Thank want to so emphasize much. that point is that the goal is to help you to make connections amongst the community of additional trainees, sort of well-funded faculty, and of course, um, NCI and NIH leadership. Great. Well, maybe I'll just take the last five minutes uh, to kind of introduce the K-12 um, a little bit, a little bit more broadly. I think people who are on the line uh, may know about this, but just to be clear, we're we're now in the third cycle of the neurosurgery K-12. This is something that Dr. Eskandar led uh, uh, for 10 years, and it's been highly, highly successful. Um, and in the third installment of the K-12, it's uh, now led by four PIs, Dr. Hanjani, who you heard from, Dr. Eskandar, who's on the line, uh, Dr. Holly, who was on the line, I'm not sure if he's still on the line, and then myself. And then as uh, we mentioned in the beginning, the, the, the people really driving behind the scenes to make this really happen is Sophie Church, who you've heard from, and then Kayla Zog, who's uh, also uh, on the line here, are helping with that. The K-12 is meant for uh, uh, really fellows and junior faculty who are looking for uh, career development uh, advice and mentorship. It's one piece of what is now becoming a multi-pronged uh, kind of approach Toward provide providing mentor mentoring opportunities for uh, uh, se uh, uh, senior residents, fellows, and especially junior faculty. 
Um, and um, the K-12 has been around for now 11 years. Uh, it's complemented by something called the Emerging Investigator Program, which is run by the Academy of Neurological Surgeons. Um, and it uh, uh, really is uh, meant to kind of broaden the number of people who can get uh, mentorship through uh, established neurosurgeon scientists. Uh, that is now uh, this year being complemented by another program called the Neurosurgeon Scientist Training Program. Uh, that's for residents, um, and uh, it, it is in conjunction with the R25 program, a way as residents, uh, usually mid-level and more senior residents, uh, getting plugged into those uh, two mentoring programs to help them get to uh, uh, junior faculty status and K-Award uh, type of uh, program. So uh, we'll talk about more about those. Uh, and then lastly, there's a couple of uh, two, uh, 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 subspecialty sections that are developing mentoring programs. One is the spine section is uh, developing something I think they call now the Spine Emerging Investigator Program. It's modeled after the broader Emerging Im Investigator Program, but it's specific to the spine uh, uh, folks and sponsored by the spine section. Zach Ray uh, is the leader of that, uh, so more to come on that. And I'm, I'm told informally that the tumor section is also interested in doing something. So what I think you're seeing is a group of people who are really passionate about science, passionate about mentoring the, the next generation who are banding together and really creating a community of neurosurgeon, a new community of neurosurgeon scientists to help each other along uh, this journey. It's, it's a hard journey, but it's a fun journey and we're all here to help you. And this webinar series is designed for that. Uh, so it's gonna be every other month um, and it's going to uh, include, oh boy, where do I have it? Uh, hold on. <laughs> it's going to include uh, topics. Uh, Sophie, did you give it to me? Yeah, here it is. Oh, I know where it is. I know where it is. Yeah, here, here are the dates. I'll just give you the dates. Um, actually, what I'll, maybe I'll share my screen. You can see this. Um, share. Can you see that? So here, here are the, uh, here are the uh, uh, seminar series. We just did the February one. The next one will be April 11th. There'll be, we'll get this out. Uh, if you check on the website, uh, NRCDP website, or you check, uh, check on our uh, Twitter account, this will always, always be posted so, uh, to, so you can find it. Uh, uh, this one we call the good, the bad, and the ugly of implicit bias and ways to actively incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion into your academic program. The June 13th will be managing yourself and others, what you haven't been taught. August 15th, deconstructing specific aims. October 17th, tips and tricks on advice on how to respond to reviewer critiques. December uh, and, uh, and beyond are not determined, but, but more to come on that. So maybe I'll end, end there. And then if uh, Dr. Hanjani, Dr. Eskandar, Holly uh, Gebhardt, any of those want to uh, comment on uh, what about the K-12 program and about the webinar series, please speak up now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, Greg. I was just going to add that uh, really one of our main focuses uh, of this next cycle is, is the DEI effort. Uh, and I think that uh, how to weave this into your academic program is something that I think everyone is trying to figure out and understand. And so we have the next seminar on April 11th that's gonna largely focus on that. And I think we're gonna get a great understanding about how to really make this happen and make this work in your academic program. Uh, and we're gonna have some great speakers and have uh, opportunities to discuss this. And you'll see we're also going to have more uh, discussion about this really at multiple touch points throughout the year. Uh, but this next one will be our, our, our first one really focused on it. Please, anything, Sophie, I've, I've left out so far, Sophie? Um, after um, tonight, um, I'll be sending out a survey, very, very brief, just about um, this. Obviously, this is our inaugural session. Um, we want to hear feedback, what we could do more of, what you'd like more of, um, and especially if you have thoughts about topics that would be particularly useful. We want this to be useful for you. That is the driver um, behind all of this. So um, please, if you have questions about any of the programs that were mentioned, um, I will send the survey um, request and you can reach out to me with any questions. I may not know the answer, but I'll be able to put you in touch with someone who can help. So maybe, maybe have, I'll, I'll make one last uh, comment and then uh, move. Uh, maybe Dr. Eskandar can have the last word uh, since he's been running this for so long. Uh, but I, I want this to be, we want this to be inclusive. So it does not matter if you're a junior faculty, a senior faculty, if you're a resident, you're a medical student, if you're a neurosurgeon or not a neurosurgeon, you know, if, if uh, please get the word out, send the link, uh, uh, have people register. You know, we want this to be inclusive so as many people uh, can attend 
uh, the webinar series and, and, and gain whatever, uh, hopefully uh, something of value uh, during this uh, uh, during these events, because we're trying to broaden the community uh, of people interested in this kind of work. So that's my last plug. Uh, Ahmad, uh, I'll give you the last word. Yes, no, great job, everyone. So and, and I hope what everyone's hearing is that there's a tremendous amount of you know interest, energy, commitment on the part of academic neurosurgery, you know, on the part of the NIH and NINDES and, and organized neurosurgery to basically, you know, develop more neurosurgeon scientists. And I think everyone understands that there's a lot of value in that. You know, neurosurgeons just have really unique access to patients, tissues, a kind of understanding of these things that other people don't have. And, uh, you know, whenever, you know, we've sort of applied our energy to this, it's been very successful. So, you know, my advice is, yes, you know, attend these webinars, learn as much as you can, engage with people in this group, think about how you want to structure your program or your career going forward. And, you know, yeah, give it all you've got because, you know, people have been very successful and there's a, there's a lot of collective sort of uh, commitment to, helping people, mentoring people, getting them funded, getting them going. So, uh, you know, I think it's a great opportunity and I'm happy that, you know, everyone has joined. I hope you can get other people to join and you continue engaging with this community and and that you, in fact, go on and really develop your own, you know, uh, scientific career. So um, that's it. And, uh, you know, everybody here is fantastic. You know, Greg, Seppi, Langston, Sophia, they're tremendously, tremendously motivated and committed to this and, and they really want to see everyone succeed. So that's it. Okay, everybody have a great night. Thanks for everybody making it. And thanks for the faculty and leaders who uh, attended. And Nas and uh, Joanna, thank you so much for your time. Yes, bye -bye. thank you very much. Great. Thank great you, bye-bye. Thank you. It was our pleasure. Good night.